Welcome to lesson one of functional annotation. Uh, today we're going to be talking and discussing about the, uh, the way that we predict proteins. So this is how we're going to look for open reading frames in bacteria and archaea, open reading frames in eukaryotes, and then a quick transition and chat about transition tables, uh, or tra translation tables, sorry. So the first thing is, is I want to lay out uh, this very grand schema. So this is uh, the NCBI's PGAP pipeline, so the prokaryotic genome annotation pipeline. Um, this is a, the process that when you submit a genome to NCBI that your genome goes through to get to the point where then it gets published and is publicly available to everybody else. And today we're going to talk about this one little section, this little area um, highlighted in red, uh, which they've, uh, they classify by their old name at NCBI, that they, a tool that they've had for a long time called ORF Finder. And so these open reading frames in bacteria and archaea are somewhat fairly easy pr to predict. Um, it uses a gene model uh, of, of how, uh, an ab initio gene model of how genes are, are determined in, in bacteria and archaea. And it's looking for a, a very small number of elements. Um, and those things include a ribosome binding site that is predicted within some distance between, uh, before the start of a, of a potential gene. Uh, one of three stop codons in bacteria and archaea, one of three stop codons in bacteria and archaea, and then in many situations, these gene callers, they aren't able to deal with uh, frame uh, interruptions, right? So anytime that there's an issue with your assembly or there's a, an actual change in the DNA of your organism, if you're, if you're able to determine that, if you end up with a uh, missense mutation, uh, where all of a sudden you have a coding protein and then it's and then it, it no longer is able to code anymore, it's it fails, right? So you might be able to in some instances if it if that fragment still uh, meets the minimum requirements of whatever tool you're using, you might still get a fragment of that of that protein. But at the same time, if you're looking for something and there's a, an issue, you might miss that gene because of those types of uh, of errors. And so there are two. Let me rephrase that. There are multiple tools for gene prediction uh, when it comes to bacteria and archaea. Here are two of them. Um, and I've laid out these two for two specific reasons. The first one is uh, gene mark S2, uh, which is currently used by the NCBI PGAP pipeline, right? So this is what NCBI is using to annotate your uh, genomes when you submit them. And then Prodigal, uh, which was is a, is a slightly older tool but was designed and is integrated as part of the Joint Genome Institute. So these are uh, for maybe the average uh, uh, genome jockey for uh, microbes. These are the tool, two pipelines that you might be pulling genomes from. And so that's the reason why I wanted to talk about these tools. And so uh, the GeneMark S2, uh, which is a new version of GeneMark S, which is a, a program that's a, over 20 years old at this point, the original version, it does exactly what that last slide does. It looks for a ribosomal binding site uh, and promoters and things that are upstream of your start codon, right? So some distance upstream from your start codon, continues to follow through the signal as far as it can until it reaches the stop codon. And so one of the things that uh, is unique about GeneMark S2 uh, is that there's the normal pipeline that uh, genes can go through, which is this arrow here, the typical coding region. So that's when you have no mistakes or errors or any issues, or you're not dealing with a bug that's a, a little bit more uh, diverse than the usual standard model. But then it also has built into it uh, an, uh, a component that allows it to look for atypical coding regions, right? So these would be organisms that may or may not use the same um, codons for all the amino acids. Uh, these are organisms that may have different features. And instead of a ribosome um, binding site um, before their start codon, it might be another component there. And so, it has that built into it and allows it to make some uh, decisions as it's going through the process of predicting your proteins. The other thing it does, and, and so does Prodigal, is it tries to resolve issues where there might be overlapping open reading frames. And so here's a number of different uh, objects here. And, and it has intrinsically properties that allow it to determine which one's the more likely candidate for your, your protein, um, uh, your open reading frame and there, therefore your protein. And then I just wanted to point this out. So this is a, a very new tool, right? It it's came out in uh, 2018, so it's less than a year and a half old. Um, one of the tables that they, they put, it out, put out are uh, the number of misannotated genes, so the false negatives, right? So uh, proteins that should have been there but aren't 
present. And so uh, this is the classic Gene Mark S. This is the one that came out in the early 2000s. Glimmer 3, which is a very common tool at the time. And then Prodigal, which is the one across the, the, the bar, uh, boundary here. And then uh, Gene Mark S2. And so for in this example, um, once you got past uh, a certain nucleotide length, about 300 base pairs, the Gene Mark S2 tool had the better recall of the true proteins that were part of this data set. Um, we go into the semantics there of what type of data set did they use, why, why did it perform better, there are lots of issue, uh, elements that go into that. Obviously, I'm going to be demoing Prodigal uh, as the, the, the tutorial in a, in a short bit, um, but just so everyone's aware that that, that, that is an option. Particle, on the other hand, is a, a slightly older tool. It's coming up close to its 10-year anniversary of, of being in existence. And so um, some of the features that it has is, one, it doesn't have a really nice uh, image from the paper to steal. And so you don't get a nice schematic like this. But it does uh, have its uh, pros and cons listed in a, in a pretty easy to follow wiki um, that's linked at the repository for this lesson. Um, and some of its benefits are it runs quickly, it runs in an unsupervised manner. So it uses um, uh, already predetermined or as you're going calculated uh, a machine learning algorithm to determine what would be the best way to call uh, proteins on your, in your genome. Um, it can handle gaps, scaffolds, and partial genes. So we'll, we'll talk about that in the tutorial. Um, it can identify the translation initiation sites and then it stores that information and gives it to you uh, as a researcher. And then you get this nice detailed summary statistic um, that we'll look at in, in the tutorial, uh, but a lot of people might not be that interested in or use once you are comfortable with the predictions that you're getting from, from the, the tool. Now eukaryotes are a completely different uh, type of process, right? So when you're looking at eukaryotic genes, and I wanna preface this for here of, I learned a lot of this yesterday. I am an expert in uh, bacteria and archaea and definitely not in eukaryotes. So um, if you have done this before, you already have way more experience than I do. Uh, and if you're looking at this and going, whew, I'm glad I work with bacteria and archaea, then know that the feeling is mutual. And so the, thing that, um, the things that a eukaryotic gene prediction tool need to be aware of are elements like introns, exons, untranslated regions, and splice forms. And so these are all things that happen as part of eukaryotic uh, genes and proteins. So you have to identify areas that are, are coded in the gene, but then aren't translated. You have to find the regions that are removed by the introns and only look for the protein coding parts and the exons. Um, and then you have to understand that sometimes you can have the ability to have the same uh, gene structure that when translated differently end up with a different protein product. So these are all things that make working with eukaryotic genes really difficult. But there are two tools uh, that when I um, asked the instructors of the, uh, the, of, the, of the BVCN where they would be going if they were looking for tools like this, two tools uh, came back as like, oh, well, these are the ones that people use. So one of them is Breaker 2. And so I wanted to highlight here what goes into the preparation of Breaker 2. And so the, you have to uh, create a repeat library and mask your genome of these repeat sequences, right? So the, in eukaryotic genomes, there's a lot of areas that have uh, extensive amounts of uh, repeat regions, um, and you have to get rid of those. So the tool that was mentioned in the uh, tutorial for Breaker 2 is Repeat Masker. You need to trim and align uh, some RNA-seq data, if you have it, uh, to your genome. And so trimming your uh, RNA-seq data was recommended trim galore, and then passed and then aligned to your uh, genome using HiSat2. And then you also want to make sure that you then have high quality transcripts, if, you, if they're available, um, and, and, and use a splice aware aligner like Picard, which then can take your full um, transcript and, um, and match to the pieces around the gene that you're looking for. And then after all of that pre-step, you run, you run Breaker 2. And so there are two types of, two versions of Breaker. Uh, Breaker 1, which has been around for a little bit longer, um, and it uses the information uh, from two other modeling tools, as well as your genomic and RNA-seq data to generate a full gene structure uh, in a novel genome. Breaker 2 takes us a little bit further using an advancement of the gene mark uh, ET model 
uh, to increase the ability to find um, to, to find genes uh, that might not be where you might not have information at all in the novel protein. So it increases its rate of being able to find novel genes in an organism that's truly novel in which there's no other no other reference material to, to compare it to. Um, this is the, their breakdown of how that works. So you need your genome, um, you need your genome information, you need your uh, uh, RNA-seq information, and all that gets combined into a final prediction uh, of, of genes in your um, organism. The other tool that was mentioned to me, went too far, was uh, Maker. And so Maker version three just came out this year in 2020. Again, uh, you'll see that a lot of these steps are very similar uh, to the steps that are in, um, uh, in, in Breaker, which is you have to mask out your repeats, you have to align your RNA-seq data uh, and your expressed uh, transcripts to your genome, you have to align proteins, if you have them from a neighboring organism, to your genome. You make some ab initio predictions based off of all that and then synthesize all your data together uh, to make sure that you have a, a consistent model. And so the thing to emphasize here is that Maker is an annotation pipeline and not a gene predictor. And all of these other steps here up until the ab initio prediction are actual other existing software tools that are designed to do that step um, as their sole uh, purpose of the tool. And Maker, what Maker does is take all that information and then produce a, a likely model. And so in this example here, each of these different lines comes from a different source uh, uh, or evidence source of where the gene might be present. And so it's laid out here. So there's a, a protein alignments uh, in, in yellow and, and pink, the EST alignments in white, um, their ab initio gene prediction in blue, uh, a different EST alignment using BLAST-N, identifying where the repeats were, so this would have been masked out. And then ultimately, Maker then makes a gene prediction based off of all this collective information that then looks like this in blue, where you have your exons in blue, which will be uh, um, uh, excised together and generate a protein and your introns in the intervening space. And so this is just an example that they give um, for the increase of that. So you have a, a novel organism here, where if you just use an ab initio prediction, you might only be able to predict about 15% of, uh, of your uh, proteins that are, are present, and that when using Maker 2, you're actually able to expand that to uh, about 50%. Again, not great. We're not getting all the data, but this would be allowing you to capture information that otherwise wouldn't be able to be um, captured for a novel organism. So with that, I just want to emphasize what the big differences are between uh, the bacteria and archaea and the eukaryotes. So the, the, the thing is, is that bacteria and archaea, they use ab initio prediction, which uses a set of basic rules to determine an open reading frame. Um, the more standard your genome is, the better the tool works, but there are ways to design rules for alternative genotypes. And so if you're working with organisms that are uh, a little bit more strange, um, extremophiles, archaea, things that are, are not and have not had previous examples in culture or, or reference genomes, there are tools that take that into consideration and, and they're available uh, to help you find those gene predictions. For eukaryotes, it's almost completely the opposite. So you're reliant on previous data sets. You're using your transcriptomic data, you're using protein predictions of close evolutionary relatives to generate through a conglomeration of tools uh, as much data as you can to generate a prediction of a, of a novel Gene, gene set in, a, in an organism. And with that, so all of this uh, leads to that point where you have an open reading frame, it's in nucleotide space, um, and you have your ATCs and Gs. At some point, you need to convert that to a protein. And a lot of these tools actually have that built in, um, specifically, uh, especially the bacteria and archaea ones, right? So uh, prodigal, as an example, automatically translates your open reading frames in using the uh, code 11 translation table, which is the translation table for bacteria and archaea, but it has components built into it so that if, um, if it, after running through that, you've told it it's a bacteria, so you're, it's pretty confident that it should be finding uh, proteins. If it doesn't find proteins, it can actually run through and use some of the other codes uh, by default to, to find the proteins that it needs to. And then as you can see, when you start to get into the eukaryotic space, things get a lot more uh, complex. 
a lot of these translation tables are for the mitochondria, right? So if you're trying to look at uh, the core genome of a uh, eukaryote, uh, those codes won't be useful to you. But uh, a lot of these nuclear codes down here will be um, and allow you to uh, approach that information uh, that you need to go from open reading frames to proteins. And so with that, I'm going to wrap up the lesson. Uh, please come back for lesson two, where we'll be talking about predicting function uh, using orthologous comparisons. Thank you very much.